What is going on guys? Today we're going to be going over three tactics that I use for Kobe efficient and then one bonus tactic at the end that I guarantee nobody is using for Cobia that you can catch. Cobia, African Pompano, Grouper, Hog Snapper, all that kind of stuff as well while you're doing it. 90% of the fish are caught by 10% of the fishermen. Of 100 boats going out on a Saturday, 80 of them are following the crowd. 10 of them shouldn't be past the inlet. 8 are dialed in for the most part. Two are professionals that are relentlessly dedicated to putting fish on deck despite any conditions, day in and day out, adapting and using past experience. Sit down, strap in, and get ready to take some notes. We're going to take the fishing game to the next level. Welcome to the Obsidian Fishing Podcast. So, we'll go ahead and start off with bucktails. Cobias are known for sight fishing. Bucktails are easily one of the most common lures to use for them. Seeing everything from plastic heels, but I think a good bucktail, I've seen orange do really well, chartreuse, white, or like a little bit of a combo of both. Some guys like to put like a sluggo on the back or a curly tail, something like that. I don't think the color really matters. I more so look for the right weight, you know, you don't want something that drops too fast. So I'd say like a, I like a one ounce to a two ounce, depending on the current, depending on your rod and reel setup, that type of thing. But you really want something that you have confidence in. Um, don't be tying on a new jig every 30 minutes, right? It's like, otherwise you guys are uh, wasting time. But better yet, have one of your boys in the boat. You know, he's fishing uh, orange and white and you're fishing a chartreuse and the other guy's just fishing a pure white, something like that. Um, so, ways you can fish the bucktail though, is I've caught them where I've seen them like a school of shad popping out and I'll throw it past that. You wanna throw past where they're at. Don't throw it right on top of their head. Sometimes it does work and they'll eat it, you know. Sometimes they're chewing the paint off the side of the boat. Sometimes they're a little more skittish, right? So, it just depends on the day and the individual fish itself. Some I've seen some fish where they just crush anything you throw in front of them, and then others that you know are real like kind of agile, like a freshwater trout, where it's like you have to throw way up wind of them, bring it into them, give them the right presentation, and then they'll bite. So, anyways, back to the bucktail. What I typically like to do, like if I've got a bait ball or something, um, throw it past that bait ball, and then I just rip it through that bait ball. And then I'll let it drop either like right in the middle or towards the edge of it. And those fish, some, they're like sitting there underneath just corralling the bait. And sometimes you'll see that bait ball split and that's when they're coming up and feeding. So that's when I'll try to either target that split or you want to drop and let it fall underneath of the bait ball. You don't want to just, sometimes they're watching it too. And I found that like any fish from largemouth bass to cobia, when I throw it and rip it and stop it, they like to hit it on the stop. You know, jigging for tuna, same thing. Like you're pumping, pumping and on that. When you pump, stop, they're gonna smack it on the stop. So try it a couple different times, you know, before you guys like pull right up onto that bait ball, throw it past them, crank it, let it drop a couple times, see if you get a bite there. Um, try it on the outside and the inside, like I said. If you see them, cobia cruising on the bottom, that's another good tactic for bucktail, um, depending on how clear your water is. It doesn't hurt. Like if you know where they're, if they're cruising, you know, up the beach, I like throw it past them and bring it into them. And that's just like, I'll go pop, pop and let it fall. And you're bouncing it right off the bottom where it's kind of like kicking that sand up every time. Um, you can also put little piece of live bait on it you know if you guys have the cobia love crabs you know so like it doesn't hurt to throw a piece of crab on it's not a tactic that's used a whole lot but it does work i've caught cobia doing it you can also throw a piece of bunker shad whatever um on that bucktail so pop off the bottom or reel and drop it's not bucktail, you can also sight fish with bucktail. A lot of guys like in Virginia, um, I've caught Kobe everywhere from Florida, the Gulf to, you know, Virginia Beach. Haven't done a whole lot of fishing in the Northeast. But 
when you're popping it off the bottom, that's usually sight fishing. If you see them cruising, you know, that's sight fishing as well. And that's like my go-to tactic would be that bucktail because you can throw it a mile. You can do all kinds of different tactics with it. You can rip it past them. You can let it drop. They'll chase it down and bite it, or they'll just, boom, swim up super fast and crush it either way. Um, yeah, but I do prefer live bait. The reason I use live bait over over bucktails is I usually get a better hookup ratio. A, because it's a circle hook. B, once you have the circle hook, you're going to keep more of those fish hooked. And those, as you guys know, those cobias are mean ass fish and they will fight hard. So my top two live baits, um, if you guys have eel available, definitely have eel, you know, uh, buy a couple of them. Like I'd say probably six to a dozen, something like that. An eel is not something that you want to be fishing all day. That's more like I'm going to I'm going to save them a fish like my bucktail, my shad, my dead bait, whatever. Um, and then when I see one, I'm going to grab that eel that's been chilling in a live well, flip it out. And those cobia will smack an eel usually. If they don't eat an eel, I don't think they're going to eat like anything. <laughs> so um, if you guys don't have eels, though, some other really good bait would be like live shad. You know, if they're shad balls uh, or bunker, however you want to say it. Cruising up and down the beach. You know, what me and my buddies usually do is cruise up, throw some bucktails in there, see if a cobia is on that bait ball. If they're not, go ahead and throw the cast net, catch some bait for the day. And then we would keep like, you know, whatever for a live bait. You don't want to put too many shad in the live well because they'll beat each other up and there's not enough oxygen. So that's one thing you guys do have to experience with or have to experiment with is how many live baits you can hold like healthy in your live well and then also consider um saving some like on the way in for next time you go cobia fishing as well you know i don't know some of you guys have like boats at the dock or whatever and yeah like a little shad pin those guys get pretty hardy in there you know if you leave them there for a week or so so anyways back to bait ball fishing how I like to fish bait balls is, you know, you usually see the dark spot on the surface. Sometimes you can see them flipping um, or you just see them, right? And I'll rig up my eel, my shad, whatever, and I'll throw that in there. And I like to fish the outside in because those cobia are typically looking for that loner shad. You know, the ones that aren't like in the heat of that bait ball. If you flick it, you know, your live bait right on top of that bait ball, odds are he's probably not gonna see your bait unless he splits that bait ball and yours has got that circle of hanging out of his mouth and he can't keep up with the rest of the guys, um, which I have caught fish, you know, before doing. But I'll typically target the outsides. And then another tactic, like I said, is that bait ball is, where like say you do throw it on the far outside of that bait ball let it chill there for a second and then on the crank in i'll crank it through that bait ball and then stop it like f right I'll, I'll try to do like right on the edge and then crank it another five feet stop it again because sometimes those kobe will be sitting there looking and then they see that guy split off from the crowd and they'll come up and smack him you know because he's by himself and that's really all all there is to bait ball fishing is you know sometimes there's cobia on the balls Sometimes, <laughs> as weird as that sounds, sometimes they're on them, sometimes they're not. So like those fish might be feeding or there might be nothing at all or they're on the ball and they're not feeding at the moment. And the cool thing about bait ball fishing is you can just go from one to the next up and down the beach. Uh, North Carolina, Virginia, Florida, anywhere like, you know, you guys get those good bunker runs in the spring. That's my favorite way to fish. And the third tactic would be anchoring up and you're going to chum set some live bait dead bait that type of thing usually you're going to want i would say minimum three rods out up to about five um how i like to do it is drop that chum bag down if you guys can have two chum bags strongly recommend it you know maybe put one on the anchor line halfway uh up so that way there's kind of like a tactic nobody talks about 
there's different columns in the water depending on how deep you're fishing i'll typically take one and put it like i'll do a loop knot on the anchor line have that about halfway out or halfway down the water column i should say and then the next one is i'm gonna have one right off the stern and that's going to be like on a weight another anchor directly on the bottom you can put one up top i do think it's a little excessive because typically those fish aren't right on the top of the water but if you are seeing them directly on the top highly recommend it given the day though typically you know play your typical conditions so those fish are going to be in that middle water column to the you know on near the bottom so you know two chum bags out i'll have two rods like straight and the what you like when you're anchored up your boat's going to swing back and forth so you don't want two lines same area at like the same distance because if they're the same distance they're going to crisscross up and you guys are going to drag into each other and get tangled so what i like to do is stagger my lines so i'll just like start on one end of the boat and i'll kind of like work my way so like on my left you know poor side or whatever i'll have the farthest line out and then the second one right off the stern um i'll have that one like a little bit closer in and then the you know starboard stern i'll have that one a little bit closer in than that one and then like the outside one i'll have that like right there under the chum ball and you want to have a kind of like a cone okay so like you're thinking about it right your chum is at the boat and as that current takes it it's kind of going out in a way it's getting dispersed so you want your line you don't want all your lines boom straight off the back of the boat you know because that way it limits you know those cobia that are cruising they might not cut right past your stern if all your lines are out that way so yeah have those four lines that's what i recommend three or four out you know and i like to use a carolina rig or even like a three-way swivel i use a circle hook all the time i if you guys know you know i've been listening i absolutely love circle hooks i like the super mudo owner um something in anywhere from like four aught up to eight aught depending on your size honestly don't think you need a giant hook you have your carolina rigs out or your three-way with a weight and you guys got to have different weights sometimes the current is bad sometimes your boat is really swinging back and forth on that anchor line depending on how much line you have paid out so bring some heavy weights that way your stuff doesn't drag all over the place and then you also got to play with how how tight you want your lines right like if you have all your lines tight they're going to get drug over to the left and drug over to the right. So you got to play with that. I, I like to always check my lines about every half hour. So I'll just do a rotation. I don't crank them all up at one time. I'll just do a rotation. And that goes anywhere, for anything. You know, if you're trolling, bottom fishing or whatever, always check your lines. Fished with a guy one time. He did not want to check our trolling lines, but we had we ran through a weed line and we had we were dragging weed on the ballyhoo for god knows how long so like just check your bait you know if a shad might have flung off or whatever a crab might have got you i don't know anyways moving along so you got your three lines out and then i'll have a like a light line or a live bait ready to go sometimes those cobia will come up they won't see anything on the bottom you know if they're halfway up on the uh in the water column you can fish a bobber too. I've seen like a lot of guys, especially in the Chesapeake Bay, do that with a live bait. You know, you could throw a croaker on there, a shad, an eel, or whatever, where you have like a big ass bobber and you fling that thing out the back. And I just, if you're gonna fish that way, you're anchored up, I would only have one of those. That's what I recommend. You could have two, but once you have like, if you're anchored up and you have a couple bobber lines out, you're gonna get tangled up fast. So do that that's really cool for fish in the upper water column if they're not in that upper water column though or like they cruise right up to the you know the back of the boat i always have a light line ready to go rigged up with like a shad or an eel or something like that that way you can flick it there right there to them and sight fish them if they come up and if you guys want to get a double hookup a lot of times if you're fishing like that dead bait or live bait on the bottom on those carolina rigs 
and you hook one, a lot of times he's going to bring up one or two or three of his friends. So always have that light line ready to go. That way you can flick it out if he brings up a couple friends and you have a double hookup right there. Tactic I promised you guys before we start going over gear is jigging. You're like, well, what, what does that mean, right? How do we jig? There's different kinds of jigging. These like bottom jigs, I like something a little stouter, a little fatter, a little heavier. Um, the Shimano flat falls are cool. And then these uh, Daiwa SK jigs. So how you're gonna fish these is on the bottom, okay? Like if you guys are grouper fishing or like you know where some really good hard bottom is, you know, if those Kobe are on the bait balls or if they've been on the bait balls and you kind of miss that bite, they might be just sitting offshore a bit, you know, especially if you guys have some weather rolling or something like that. Those kingfish, spanish mackerel, whatever, there's a reason they get out, out there on top of those rocks in those particular spots. So there's no reason a cobia wouldn't be there. If the bait fish are there, they'll be there. Or they might just be there chilling. And one, you can do bucktails. So you can jig, you know, bucktails, bottom fish and bucktails um, works really well and you'll catch some flounder doing that. Or you bounce one of these jigs off the bottom. Um, and what I like to do is fish, you wanna, you're gonna obviously fish about 80 pound fluoro or heavier. On the jigs, they're pretty aggressive. You know, they're usually not too particular on light line. But all you're doing is just like banging the bottom. You're ripping it up and making sure it's crashing back down on the bottom. And a lot of times you're gonna rip it up, let it go but to the bottom, and they're gonna hit it on that strike. So you're gonna think you're on the bottom, and you're gonna go to rip it up, and he's gonna be on there. Um, they do eat long jigs, you know, like a typical knife jig. I've got one over here that I really like. Um, something like this, about 180 grams. Color. I don't really think matters. I, I like a blue and white or pink and white or a silver. As long as it's got like a little bit of glow on it, they will eat knife jigs. But those cobia's mouth, you know, if they eat it from the side like that, sometimes you don't get a good hookup. That's why I like the shorter, stouter ones. Typically like one hook. I don't fish two hooks when I'm like bottom bouncing. That, that <coughs> setup is more like for tuna jigging. All right, so now I'm gonna go over some gear that I like to use. Personally, I think Kobe are really rough on your gear, and I like to pregame some of the things before we go. So I'll have anywhere from 40 pound liter up to 80 pound liter, because you're not putting that much drag on them anyways. Typically, you know, you're you're catching them that upper part of the water column, so. You don't have to worry about them snagging on a reef or whatever. Like if you're fishing around like a pier, some structure, something like that, I would go for the opera, for the heavier gear, you know, 100, 130 pound fluoro, something like that. That way you can really put the heat on them, turn their head when you have to type thing. But anyways, I like to rig up a bunch of circle hooks. I use about 18 inches to 24 inches of leader. And I do like to use a swivel on that just so I can do like quick gear change. Um, if you guys have a strong braid to fluoro knot that you like to use, I'll, I'll go over one in another video I'm gonna make this week. But I think Kobe are, are like so aggressive. You don't have to do like that braid to fluoro knot. I like to throw a swivel on there. That way I can also rig up like a Carolina rig on the fly type of thing. It's one less piece of gear I gotta get ready while I'm out on the water. So, and only use one rig per fish. Cobia fight so hard and like they've got like little catfish teeth if you guys have ever caught them. And I've seen that kind of wear on the fluoro. Um, so I, I just like to be ready, get as much fishing time as I can and I'll rig up you know, your favorite circle hook, I use the owner, Super Mudos. Super strong, offset circle hook. Have an excellent hookup ratio, in my opinion. It's my go-to. You know, I've talked about it before, but, like, I love a hook 
with a little bit of ass on it, especially if you're using like a small circle hook. Because if you guys have like small shad, you don't want a nine knot circle hook sticking out of that shad's nose. Um, typically how I like to rig them as well is, you know, in line with their, their nose. I don't like to go crossways. I found that like when you hook a shad crossways, he's not going to last long. It's like cutting the air off to his head or something. I don't know. And then also through the back, you can rig them. Um, but I don't like to rig them through the back typically because you're going to be working that shad a little bit. You're going to be throwing them out. You're going to be trying to fling them a little bit farther. That nose gives you a little bit more oomph to it. You know, it, the hook's got something to hold on to. And when you're cranking them back in, he'll look a little more natural. I can't tell you how many times I have had cobia when I think they're, they're not going to bite that shad and I start cranking it back to the boat. They come out from underneath that bait ball and smack it on the way in. So... I always rig them through the nose. That's just my personal preference and what I think works the best and has the most natural presentation for cobia fishing. If you guys are like, nah, not a circle hook guy, um, I do have an alternative for you. Badass J hook. Also owner, offshore live bait hook. It's also pretty thick and it's got the offset tip. I really like that offset tip because I think it's just a little more, your odds of snagging some meat on them in their mouth is a lot better than having something that's perfectly in line. And then these two, if you do hook one on a live bait hook, that thing is thick, right? It's sharp, but it's thick. So I'll set that hook. You want to let them eat it like a circle hook. As soon as they got it there, I'll just like flip the bail over and load the rod up just crank load the rod up and that's that we're using a j hook though set that hook let them have a little bit let them have a little bit. i'll usually count to like five let them run that way it kind of gets a little bit deeper in his throat or the back of his mouth and then i will yank that rod two ways to sunday right and then when, once you come tight on him he's taking a little drag give it another you know like two or three more times tug that thing in so that you know that j hook really catches and the odds are of the meat going into the corner the bend of that hook leader fluoro you know i use cr gold um anywhere from 40 to 100 pound i probably have like if you were wanting to go out sometimes those fish are real finicky so like on live bait i would definitely use 40 and you know, that way you're, you're given like the most agile presentation. But if you're using a bucktail, I'd probably go with that 60 or 80. And then if you're fishing on the bottom, you're going to want to beef it up um, to about 80 to 100, something like that. All personal preference. But the more weight you're using, the more or like the heavier line you're going to want to use. That's how I typically gauge it. You know, I don't want to fish 40 pound with a Carolina rig and it's got you know, six ounce egg sinker slinging up and down the rig or whatever. I don't think that's going to do you any justice when, <laughs> when you're cranking a fish in, you know, you don't want uh, your leader to be the reason you lose a cobia. It's hard enough to catch one. Going over some gear though. One of my bottom rigs is I like it with something a little bit heavier. Um, Shimano Travala, something short, you know, this is like five, eight model and you can cast the bucktail on this heavy ass Travala. So it's a pretty good multi-use rod. This one's I think extra heavy, or no, extra, extra heavy. One of my grouper rods. And the cool thing about like these spinner rods is that they're really like multi-use. And you know, you can use them for grouper fishing, bottom fishing, uh, popping, cobia fishing, anything like that. I personally think spinning rod is like the most like a heavy to medium heavy to heavy you know eight or ten thousand spinning rod is the most versatile saltwater fishing rod you can have you can catch just about anything on it you know it may not be tactical in all situations but you can make it work so i'll typically have like something heavier that's gonna be like my bottom rigs what i got my like my carolina rigs on or like say i got like a 
three ounce bucktail or whatever. And then something for lighter, like fly lining. You know, when you're throwing that live bait out, sight fishing that shad or the eel. Shimano Therese, you know, something a little bit longer, six, six, seven foot, something like that, personal preference. I don't think it makes a whole lot of difference. I do like a little bit lighter tip on it. That way I can fling that eel or the shad out a little bit further. Um, as far as line goes, on my bottom rig like that uh, Shimano Travala, I'll fish 80 or 100 pound braid. This one I might go with like a 65 pound braid. That way it just casts a little bit better and I've got a little bit more line capacity because if you're fishing 40 pound leader and you know, you're fishing an 8,000 size spinning reel and you got a circle hook, live bait, and you hook one of those 80 pound cobias, you're gonna want something with some line capacity because he's gonna be doing a lot of running, right? And you're not gonna put a lot of heat on him with 40 pound leader. Anyways, moving along, my favorite bucktail rod is the star. You guys didn't see that. I just jammed the rod tip in the ceiling. <laughs> But anyways, Star Rods Plasma, 7 foot. Um, this is a 12 to 30, 3 eighths to 3 ounce. Absolutely love this rod. It's awesome for tuna fishing, cobia fishing, um, bucktail fishing, anything like that. I like it because it's got quite a good backbone on it, like a stiffer backbone. But then that tip is like a soft tip. So I don't have to worry about snapping a rod if I really fling a uh, 2 ounce bucktail out. This one, I could opt for a 65 or 80 pound braid. If you got a 10,000 size spinning reel, I'd probably go with that 80 pound. If you got an 8,000, I'd probably go with that 65. Um, swivels, don't overdo it on swivels if you got guys are fishing a swivel. Um, you gotta think about your gear, right? So like, you don't want a marlin sized 400 pound swivel <laughs> if you're fishing a live shad, you know, you don't want that thing dragging the shad to the bottom. And then you also don't want to look like a Guggen. So you got to think about like, where's my weakest point? Your weakest point is going to be your knot. No matter what you're doing, knot's the weakest point. So 40 pound leader, probably not going to fish more than about an 80, 100 pound swivel. And those things are pretty small, 80 or 100 pounds, and you're not going to snap it. Do buy the quality swivel. Don't buy the cheap ass swivels. Okay, if you're gonna if you're gonna fish cheap ass swivel, get that 180 pound swivel, 200 pound swivel. But you know I like the Spros. Um, they've done really well for me. Never had any failures on them. And you want to reduce every aspect of gear failure, and basically just leave it up to if you're gonna lose a fish, you want it to be because that fish just popped off the hook or operator error, you know, as I like to call it. <laughs> um, thank you guys for tuning in today. Last little bit of that video got messed up, but it's all right. You didn't miss much. Um, please hit me up on Instagram, Obsidian Fishing, Zach Messer, and I'll answer any questions. If you guys want to connect, BS, whatever. Um, also doing some fishing trips, 2024. If you guys are interested in going with me, I'll be running out of San Diego. Be doing trips about every month, something like that. And I'm headed to Hawaii for a month in January. All right, guys. Peace out. Have a good Christmas.